some jobs that robots are doing, humans should not do it, period. Secondly, we already have a labor shortage. So how we want to reshore things back to America if you don't have people to do it? So the only way of matching that desire of bringing back strategic manufacturing if you don't have people. So the only solution is robot. Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we have illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and their communities. And you see we're in a different location today. We're actually visiting AAA20 Group, where they make robots. And we're here with our new friend, Marcus, who is, Marcus Kudel, who is the co-founder of AAA20 Robotics. And we're here with the CP200 palletizing robot. I call him Cooper. But right now, I'm going to ask Cooper to stop doing what he's doing so we can focus on this interview. Well, he's obedient. Yeah, Cooper's quite a good boy. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about Cooper and tell us about what just happened here when I went over and touched the robot. Basically, this is a palletizer, a collaborative palletizer. What that means is that the robot has different torque sensors in the joints, so he feels if he touches something. So it's a different type of robot that makes the safety um, an easier way to manage it. So that's why you don't see a lot of caging around like traditional industrial robots. That's the main difference. Yeah. And so it's great from a safety perspective, but it's also great from a helping humans and robots work together better in the workplace. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about today is getting ready for the future of robotics coming and how we can have humans and robots working together for a brighter future. So Marcus, you describe yourself as a robot enthusiast. And this is exciting because you guys are a hardware tech company. And we don't have a lot of those here in Las Vegas, but it's, you guys are an important part of our growing tech community here in Vegas. So thank you for bringing your company to Vegas, first of all. Thank you for having us here today. And thanks for being here with us today. So what everyone wants to know, how did you first get into robotics? And what was the aha moment that got you here to all of this? Okay, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be talking to you guys and telling a little bit about our story. So answer your question, I started my career 20 years ago in uh, multinationals. That was the easiest way I found to change my social lifestyle, being having a better life. So I started working in manufacturing. And of course, when you talk in manufacturing for big multinationals, they are already investing in robotics for many years, right? They started a long time ago. So that dream became pretty much of my American dream. So it was a pain point in the market. So USA is facing labor shortage for a while. And that's why we designed a small palletizer. Yeah, and that is one of the things about the future of the workplace is we are facing labor shortages in the United States. And we'll get into a little later how, how this can help with that and how it can help people be more effective in the workplace as well. But you guys are making incredible waves in robotics right now, AAA 20 Group making waves. What are you all about? What do you like about Las Vegas as your new home? Yeah, as we moved to Vegas in 2020, a little bit before COVID, I would say a month before, and we love Vegas. It's very easy to fly. Uh, I would say that I live in an airplane, so I'm traveling all over the place, uh, Europe, Canada, Mexico, South America. So being in Vegas makes our life easier because we have customers everywhere, right? So having an easy hub with flights and connection makes a huge difference. And Vegas, for obvious reason, is a very good hub spot, let's say, for planes and etc. So we really like it. Plus, the, uh, the weather is pretty good. I would say the fact that we don't get hit by different type of storms that could delay our deliveries or anything. So once you have a stable clima, it, it's better for the business. Yeah, we're pretty blessed here in Vegas when it comes to weather. It gets a little warm in the summers, but we've... Today that we're recording it, we're kind of we're below uh, triple digits today. So I think we're all very happy that we're we're done with that for a little while. You talked a little bit about the pain point that you saw in the labor market about why this robot, why a palletizing robot. What other opportunities do you see for this robot or for the other projects you're working on in in different industries? 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question because this robot starts from a pain point of a customer. So the customer would say, hey, I cannot find people that are willing to carry 40 pound boxes all day long. No one wants to do that job. So you can do it for three hours, but after three hours, your back's going to hurt. And doing this for years, that's not good. So no one wants to do that job. And then he said, but I don't have space because usually the factories they start growing and producing more right over the time. But then he has a wall and the building is gone. So you cannot have a huge robot there. So we designed this robot to solve two problems, labor shortage and space. But then a third problem arises. They say, I have no CapEx money to buy this robot. And I was like, well, what if instead of buying the robot, you just hire the robot as an employee? That's how it started pretty much. And, and, and that's, that's the brilliance of how you guys at, a, at AAA20 are doing things is you've created this robot as a service model, treated as an employee, not a capital investment, not a capital expenditure. And now you are providing, not, you're not just building robots, you're providing a valuable service to companies and you can you can customize these robots depending on their needs right correct yeah usually we are let's say a tailor company i would say tailor made so the customer can bring us a challenge or an opportunity or a need and it would design a solution for that application of course the reason we decided to use palletizing is because it can go to any type of industry we can produce batteries we can do cakes we can do bread we can do sodas so most of the things that are shipped from manufacturers, they come in boxes, right? So it makes our business very easy because we can move the robot from customer A to customer B without any change on the robot. And, and even if the robot did require changes, that's something that you provide as part of your service, right? Correct. Usually it's gonna be a minor change, maybe in the end of arm tooling, but usually when they're boxes, it's almost nothing. Yeah, boxes are boxes. And it's just a matter of what's in them and how heavy they are, right? Correct. So, so you and and Cooper has no problem picking up something heavy over and over and over again. Three and, shifts, and that's really exciting. So, what other things are you offering, or what other things do you think about offering that might shake up the industry a little more? Yeah, for for now, we are very focused on palletizing because, believe me or not, the US is so behind in automation compared to Germany, Japan, or even China. When you check uh, robots per capita. Uh, American manufacturing so behind for a strategy designed it many decades ago about offshoring everything. Now they're considering reshoring, right? And then you don't have people and you don't have robots. So we are really focused on palletizing for now because it's a huge opportunity. It's a market of $5 billion globally. Yeah, it's a it's insane. And as we do try to bring different industries back into the United States that have been offshored over, as you said, many decades, this is something that we all need to be considering is how do we how do we take advantage of companies like yours to give us robots to provide us with robots to do work that that maybe we don't have people who have the skills to do anymore so so every business model has challenges even something brilliant something genius like robots as a service what challenges have you found with this new business model that you're bringing to manufacturing well i can make a list, a huge list of issues we face down the road. So the first issue is that when you start designing something on the computer, it looks great. But then when you become to reality, it's a little bit different. So we made some mistakes. I made, I should say, I bought the wrong arms. I bought a lot of things by mistake. I got too excited in some aspects after some trade shows and then I overbought it and then on the end that gripper did not work in that customer because the box, it was not, it was a recyclable fiber. So the vacuum not work great. So uh, I made a mistake once I bought six arms, they were too short. So I seated in over 600,000 for like two years because of that mistake. Did you, did you ever find a use for those arms later I, on? I got very lucky. I must say that I'm blessed. So a customer brought us a tailor-made solution. So basically he needs to print the boxes, like let's say a barcode or something. And usually you have a printer on the sides and passed by a conveyor. And he want to print on the front of the box because a request of a big retail chain. And so the robot gets the printer and goes around printing a box. And for that specific application, I don't need a big robot. So the smaller robots that I had would be perfect. By coincidence, he needed six. And I had six in stock. So it was like a 
perfect end game for those robots. I love it when it all works out. That's a that's a fantastic story. So that's that was a business challenge, but robotics, as you know, is full of technical challenges. What was what was an example of something, some technical challenge you came across on one of these projects that you struggled with and how did you overcome it? That's also interesting. Also, when we program a robot, we consider, let's say, the box is 12 inches, right? But the box is not a brick, so it has variations. So we face in one customer that his box would be 12 inches and a quarter, but his pallet would also be three inches and like instead of three and a half would be four inches. So now we have almost an inch difference. And for the robot, he's gonna say, hey, I feel something's different. So we need to adapt to the gripper to accept small variations in the box. So that was a technical roadblock that we faced was to absorb those normal variations on the boxes and on the pallet. Because in the computer, it seems perfect. But when you go to reality, and how do you say to the guy, oh, this pallet is higher than it should? He cannot control the wood and the quality. It's pretty hard. Yeah. So customers aren't are go, aren't gonna go, oh yeah, sure, tell me which pallets I need to buy, or you know, their pallet supplier is not gonna go, don't tell me how to build a build a pallet, right? Yeah. So so it it's uh it's amazing that you guys are starting to factor that in of how to make the robots resilient to the environments that they're in. If that pallet comes in a quarter of an inch thicker than you expect it to come in, a quarter of an inch taller, these these robots can adapt to that and overcome, which is really great. So now a lot of people, many people are concerned that robots are going to take jobs away from humans. So what do you say to folks who are worried? Because one of the, one of the, we talked about offshoring, right? One of the, one of the big challenges we have now is all those jobs offshore, all those manufacturing jobs. What do you say to people who are concerned that robots are going to take human jobs? Yeah, we, uh, in our case, we see it from two different perspectives. The first perspective, robotics should automate repetitive tasks. So carrying boxes for 10 hours a day is not good for anyone. So these are the biggest job rotations in companies. It's like people carrying boxes, they work for a week and they just quit. That's not a fun job. They could make more money driving cars for delivering food than carrying boxes. So first, some jobs that robots are doing, humans should not do it, period. Secondly, we already have a labor shortage. So how we want to reshore things back to America if we don't have people to do it? So the only way of matching that desire of bringing back strategic manufacturing if you don't have people. So the only solution is robot. And also an interesting perspective is that if you have more robots, our cost would be lower. So I do think that robotics could increase the overall pros prosperity of the people around. Yeah, and that that doesn't even get into workman's comp, disability, all the all of the injuries people can get from doing repetitive motions, lifting things up and putting them down over and over again. Robots, we don't have to worry about disability. We don't have to worry about workman's comp. We just fix the robot, right? Correct. So we have there's a lot of advantages of that and a lot of a lot of ways we can free humans up to do things that humans are much better at and don't put their bodies at risk at from repetitive Correct. repetitive work and repetitive injuries. So now that robots are becoming more common and we, we see this beautiful vision of humans and robots working side by side, how do you see the workplace transforming? What are you most excited to see develop in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, I always question some young talents that they are considering going for a five years college university. Uh, I do think for some people it's a good match, but for example, to work in our robots, that it's a standard product, I don't need a five years engineer degree. Mm -hmm. That's not needed. So I do think America should rethink a little bit about education and do more like tailor-made. It's like small credentials as a friend from, from us that is based in Silicon Valley. It's called Circuit Launch and Mac Labs. Basically, they design a specific training for the need in the market. So let's say I need an operator to learn how to use our robots. Fine. We design a small training, takes like two months, and he's ready. And it's cheaper for him and it's better for the economy. So I do think a change is going to be the knowledge that the people need in the next coming years. Yeah, it's not like when, when I was coming up, you know, when I was coming up through engineering school. And, and engineering is probably one of the few, if you really want to be an engineer, you do need to go to engineering school because companies want engineers who are fully educated and then they'll do some training with them. But 
there are a lot of things you can do, a lot of, a lot of high-tech industry things you can do without a four-year or five-year college degree. And if you, if you get into a job like this without a degree and you decide you want to go to college later, it will be there. It's not, it's not like 30 years ago when I was going to college where it was like, you better go right out of high school or you're never going to get a chance to go, right? So 100% of you. And don't take me wrong. I'm not against the like five years degree. I'm just saying it's not for everyone. Yeah. And even people without uh, engineering fancy degree, they could work in robotics. It's just a matter of willing to learn. And with the new technology like YouTube and other things, they can learn online. Yeah. If you're interested in robotics, if you're interested in anything, figure out how you can get into it now. What is, what is the, the training you need? Co trust me, college will be there for you. Yes, so, agreed. So you've been building robots for a while now, but ultimately business is about people. Clearly. What have you learned about working with people while you've been building robots? Nice. I would say that the biggest challenge was about commitment. And it's very important in our company that we have the people committed. Let's say I have a test schedule for two days. It's happening two days, no matter what. So it's different having people involved. Oh, say, let's work it. Let's try it. And we have people, let's say, I'm going to get this done. So that was the trigger point in our mindset for our team to say, hey, I have a deadline. I must get it done. So commitment was the word that we really nailed it. Yeah, I, li I like that idea is we're, we're committing to be ready for the test on Wednesday. Yes. We're not going to try. We're not going to let's see if we get there. We're really committing to being ready for Tuesday. And yeah, things, you know, crises happen and maybe we won't be ready for Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever day I said earlier. But that idea of commitment, we, we said we were going to do it. We're going to follow through on it to the best of our ability. I love that. All right. Well, in addition to working, we like to have a little fun here. Let's play a game. If you're okay with that. So uh, the name of this game is Rapid Response. I'm going to ask you a question. Give me the first thing that comes to mind. Doesn't need to be a one-word answer, but uh, what, the, what the first thing that comes to mind is. So this is Marcus Kudel, Rapid Response. Your time starts now. Podcast recommendation. Feel the boot. Feel the boot. Tell us about that. Well, that's a very interesting podcast that helps startups uh, learning from stakes about how to raise money, different type of investment. So it's a great uh, resource for people and startups. So it's basically, it's called the science of a startup and I really love, love it. And it was a reference from a friend from Silicon Valley. All right, well, it's new to me and I'm gonna look it up. So you guys uh, check that out too. That sounds like a great one. Your favorite robot from a movie or book? I would say my favorite robot is my first kid. So <laughs> it's my own robot. I sleep thinking about this and how to make it better and better and better. Uh, was there was there something, you know, as you were growing up, was there a robot you remember that, that kind of influenced the way you do robotics from, from movies or TV or anything like that? Not really. I, I mean, I have a bunch of movies that I can think about it, but I think one of the first robots that change a little bit my perspective was the vacuum robots i think it's a very good statement because it brought the robots to the home of the people so now it's easier to explain what i do years ago when i was in manufacturing i would tell someone i do robots people would think they, they don't get it right they are not used to but once they start having robots at their home now it's easier to explain what we do for automation a, a friend of mine got a new robot vacuum a couple of months ago and he gave, just gave me his old one i was like all right i'll give this a try and now now that thing runs around my house every day and i the way i think about robots and and that's why i'm thinking about robots in the workplace and humans and robots working together because i have one doing stuff in my house as i'm trying to do stuff in my house and it, it's amazing if you don't have a robot vacuum get one it'll change your life so and that's a good example did it take your job away no it didn't take my job away in fact in fact it it what it did was it got rid of all the dog hair on the floor that I would just leave until the cleaners would come every couple of weeks. So, and you did not find the, fire the cleaners, right? No, I did not fire the cleaners, so it improved my quality of life, and it, it's great. So That's a good example how robots can bring it value to society, I would say. Yeah, I love it. What is something we should all be paying attention to? Reshoring. It's happening, no matter what. Uh, I think the strategy in the past to offshore things for profit was a good idea but 
we saw during the pandemic that's a little bit risky when you outsource everything and then during a crisis you are in trouble yeah we learned we learned a lot from the pandemic and also kind of from post pandemic what it means for our workforce if we don't have skilled folks and and skilled companies doing things onshore here in the United States so it's coming no matter i don't care where you stand politically we're going to be doing some onshoring over the next 10 years or so 100% so, so what is your get psyched up a song or your walk on music for many years i i have been thinking about eye of the tiger so whenever i have a huge challenge to overcome i play that song and i'm on that's a great one your biggest influence in life successful people i mean you have two ways of learning right or you learn with someone that already did a mistake so you don't do it or you try by your own then you fail then you learn i do think that's faster if you listen to other people and then you avoid those roadblocks yeah i mean that's that's why a lot of us start the companies we start is cuz we we don't want you to have to make the same mistakes we did we, like like you can benefit cuz we made mistakes along the way so. many so that's fantastic what is a book everyone should read it's called dream big Basically uh, uh it's from a guy called George Paul Lemon. He's Brazilian. He lives in Switzerland for many years. His net worth is probably over 20 billion. And just to give you some companies that he wants, Burger King, Heinz. So he defends on that book that pretty much the cost of dreaming it's the same if it's a small dream or a big dream. So he says big dream. Dream big, sorry. So Love that's that. pretty much his mindset. Love that. What is the best autumn activity to do in the southwest? Well, I do like Lake Mead, Lake Mead and also walking with my kid outside when it's not that hot. Yeah, well we're getting to that. It's it's just about perfect right now. We got a couple days going to be perfect here in Vegas. Amazing. So, where are you taking your next vacation? I really don't know now because I'm going to have a new baby coming in November, so I think vacation is going to take a while. Yeah, well congratulations on the new Thank baby you. and uh that vacation that will be there yes. when the time is right for you and your wife and your family. So, an important trend to watch. Manufacturing the US because we talk about reshoring, right? But just saying I'm going to bring everything back, okay. Where? Who's going to do it? How we're going to do it? So I think American manufacturing must reborn because that was the reason US become so powerful in the in the last decades on the 50s whatever mm -hmm. it was manufacturing then we let it go and now it's time to make it stronger again. So I think manufacturing is the place to watch because it must change somehow. Yeah, and it's not just about robots. It's not just about tech. We're going to need smart, capable people to be part of the 21st century future of how we do manufacturing and bring a lot of that back to the United States. Favorite sport? Tennis, for sure. Do you have a do you have a player? I would say Nadal is a good guy. Uh I used to like to I would like to play more, unfortunately I can't, but I hope one day I can play more. Well, when uh maybe you can build a tennis player and robot in the back here and uh That would be cool. You guys can I And you know it's funny. I have the the ball machine. Yeah. That th throws the ball for me, but I don't use it. But it's a great machine though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for playing our game. I appreciate it. It gives our our viewers a chance to get to know you a little bit more than maybe some of our questions do. But thanks thank for being you. a good sport about that. So, leaders everywhere are wondering how should they prepare their teams, their humans for a future where robots are their coworkers. Yeah, I think robotics is coming no matter what. Companies do that do not adapt using robots may go out of business because they're not going to be competitive so have that in mind uh companies should be looking for a specific training for their team so what happens sometimes you deliver a robot and then you ask the company okay we need to train some people then they would send one guy to be trained but then after 3 months that guy leaves the company so so i think companies should be very focusing in training people about the new technologies and not only because they need this is also keep the people commit keep their commitment to that company because they see that their employer are giving them opportunities to learn technologies and i do think this is a very good way of retaining talents yeah retention is hard and a lot of companies don't want to train people because they're afraid they're going to take what they've learned 
and then go somewhere else. And that happens sometimes, but the alternative is you don't train anyone and you don't become, and you don't become competitive. And I think one of the things that, that one of the themes we've hit today is the idea of not treating robots as technology, but treating robots as our coworkers. And I think that's going to help with that commitment to both employees and managers of this is someone, this is, this is a coworker and we need to work together, not just understand how to operate and fix it. Yeah, that's a, a very good point that brought me uh, another point. Uh, like manufacturing is not sexy. So when you talk to people that doesn't know about it, they think about manufacturing, a steel factory, dirty, old school, dark, and don't need to be that. So when you bring robots, uh, you can bring new talents, young kids. If you say, hey, do you want to work in a factory? They're going to say, no. Hey, do you want to manage a fleet of 20 robots? Oh, yeah, that would be fun. So the idea of bringing robots also could help bringing talents back to the manufacturing. They work Nowadays, they want to work only in Silicon Valley, but you have factories everywhere that they could work with robots in the U.S. Yeah, that's something that, I think is really important that as a community, we need to start the conversation, continue the conversation. Tech is about more than coding. There's, there's lots of tech in places that we don't think about as traditional Silicon Valley tech. And Silicon Valley tech is important to making sure all these things go, don't For get sure. me wrong. But there's more to tech than just coding. And there's more to tech than just Silicon Valley. And that's a message I'm, I'm trying to push out with this podcast as well. So, yeah. So you're growing into your role as a tech founder. You've been doing it for a few years now. What have you discovered about leadership that you didn't expect before you became a co-founder? Well, I, I worked for multinationals for like over 20 years, right? When something would go bad, I could blame someone, right? Like my boss is bad, that department made a mistake. I could complain. When I have a problem here, I have no one to complain. It's my own fault. Yeah. So as an entrepreneur, uh, I learned an, an interesting lesson that you cannot focus on the problem. You must find solutions. So this changed a little bit my perspective about I cannot blame anyone. So I need to find a solution. So this is a very important mindset that I think should be reinforced even in big corporations that, okay, we have a problem. You should not blame other department, you should find a solution. And this is something that reinforce in our team all the time, say, hey, don't try to, to, to blame someone. Let's find a solution. And then after we talk about lesson learned with that department. Yeah, we talked a lot about that when I was in the Air Force of don't, bosses didn't want us to bring problems. They wanted, they wanted to know about the problem, but they also want to know how we were going to solve it. And if we needed to loop other people in to solve that problem, other departments to solve that problem, that's, that's what the Colonel wanted to hear is, okay, you guys have figured out how you're going to solve this. Do you need me for anything? No, great. Go do it. Right. Got it. So yeah, was, that's exactly it. Was there a particular specific challenge that taught you this lesson? Oof. When we made our first robots that I made a lot of mistakes and we have a bunch of engineers working with us in designing that robot, right? So they would suggest, let's do like this. The other guy would say, okay, let's do this part like this. And I would say, okay, yes, let's put the puzzle together. And then it all worked. So the fault was mine. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter, right? Who was the fault? We need to find a solution. Redo the machine, redo the robots and move forward. Get yep. it done. Get it done. Don't bring me problems, bring me solutions, yeah. right? Well, our tech community in Las Vegas is a small, but it's growing thanks to people like you. How can Las Vegas, the Valley here, the different communities in Southern Nevada, how can they support entrepreneurs and tech companies like yours to help us build our tech community here? Yeah, I, I really appreciated the job you do, bringing knowledge to people, that's very important. So I think this common sense of creating a community, it's very important in the sense that if everyone is trying to do something to add value and share knowledge, that's important. And also from the government perspective, I think teaching uh, founders, let's say how to raise money, how to apply for grants, that would add a lot of value and save. Of course, we can look for YouTube and different type of knowledge, but if the government or the society helps, I would make, I think would make this process faster. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's something we hear a lot. So we'll, we'll keep working towards that and working as a community to try to get that knowledge out there, whether it comes from the government or other sources for, for founders to be able to have access to capital, whether it's 
invest investment or grants or otherwise. So that's that's fantastic. Where would you like to see our tech community in the next five to ten years? What would you what would you like to be bragging about the Las Vegas tech community in five to ten years? I think uh, we should a little bit decentralized things from some specific cities or states and bring that common knowledge to all over the US. So let's say we can have a, a hub in Vegas for like tech companies. So we could have all like meet up Vegas for robotics, robotics. So this is a great event that we should have, let's say every month in a different company showing different type of technology. So I hope by five years from now, we have a bunch of companies and buildings ready uh, to receive events and government, and we can do it more on site like we're doing today, showing this, not in a fence conference room, but in reality, showing a robot working. Yeah, I think that's what we really need to do is get more building it here, showing it here, demoing it here. We have a really great laboratory called the Las Vegas Strip for different kinds of, in this case, robots to be showing off and doing different things. We're really, that's what's really unique about Las Vegas is we can start to get some of these things into places where people, not just locally and not just in the industry, but all over the world can see them in action. I think that's fantastic. And our doors are always open to new talents and people willing to learn more about robotics. Please contact us and it'd be a pleasure to take you for our tour. Yeah, absolutely. Come on down and, and meet Cooper and see some of the other things they're doing here. There's a whole world here that you guys aren't seeing on camera. So 2024 has been a breakthrough year for AAA 20 Robotics. What major goals are you still working towards and how are you getting your team to get there? Yeah, so we see like in stages, right? So first we design our machine. It was a journey. Then we finalize our design. Then we start to rent in the robots. Then we validated our, our business model. So basically, Hertz rent cars, right? We rent robots. So this is our business model. So a factory has, let's say, working three shifts. They can have one robot doing the job of those three people that they cannot find. So the idea of renting robots is confirmed. So the idea of making money is confirmed. So it's like checked. So now the business model is validated. So our challenge for this year is to expand the business. So we are gonna be raising a, a significant amount of money this year to make it our growth. Because once we need to produce the machine to rent it, uh, our initial capital capital investment is a little bit high. Yeah. So that's why we need to raise money now to make it big. So absolutely. Well, that, sound, that sounds very exciting. It's a, uh, raising money is always always exciting and always a challenge. So yeah. So, but yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's fantastic. So in addition to the finance piece, every team needs great people. So what do you look for in someone who would want to join your team and help build the robots here? I love that question. I would say values and commitment. All the rest, we can train the team. If they have the right values and the right commitment, they can work for us. Fantastic. And we are very open to train young people and teach them everything that we know. As long as they're committed to the, to, the, to the task and also have the right values. Well, you heard it here. Bring your values, bring your commitment, and they'll teach you the rest. And speaking of teaching the rest, because it's great to bring in employees, but we also, if we want our companies to be successful, we need to be thinking about developing future leaders in our companies. What do you do as a, as a founder or co-founder to develop the future leaders in, in the company here so that you're not doing everything all by yourself in the future? Yeah, I mean, I got in, a, I started working in multinationals very young when I was 18. And I never liked the process. Hey, you need to be here, let's say 8 a.m. You must leave at 5 p.m. And I never liked it, those rules. So how I see it is about autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. Freedom. So my guys, they can arrive anytime they want. They can leave anytime they want, as long as they deliver their tasks. So the way we develop our team about leadership skills is about autonomy. What that means, he has a task, right? He needs to finish this. He needs to, to think what he needs to deliver it. He needs a helper. He needs a new machine. He needs whatever resource he needs it. Mm -hmm. He must be the one thinking about it. And he should be the one asking for it. So he's asked, okay, I need this to get it done. Fine. And my job is to give him what he needs, a new CNC machine or whatever. So I pretty much 
giving autonomy to everyone in the team so they can take their own decisions. Yeah, I think that's one of the real struggles and we've seen it coming back from the pandemic when when so many so many tech companies went to remote work and now they're trying to pull everybody back into the office and everybody's really really angry about it cuz and and I think rightly so, they feel like they can work better from home or whatever location they think works better. And I agree with that. I worked for, uh, when I was in the Air Force, I worked for squadrons where we had, we were moving all over the world, but we were in the places we needed to be to do our job best. And I think, I think what we need to, uh, for the future of work, I think what we all need to focus on is owning our outcomes, right? Just like you talked about. If there's a technician or an engineer here who, who has an outcome they have to produce and they come to you and say, I need these things to produce that outcome, that's owning the outcome, right? And then it doesn't matter whether they come in exactly at eight every day and they leave exactly at four. What matters is they own the outcome and they open that dialogue about this is what I need to produce to produce the outcome I've committed to. And regarding remote uh, working, uh, we do have a people person working in Chicago. We do have contractors in Brazil. We do have contractors in Mexico. So I don't think that's a general rule about it. I think it's pretty much dependent case by case, but we do have people working for us remotely. And of course, if the guy wanna play tennis Monday morning, it's fine. As long when we need him on Saturday night, he's also available. So I think comes out to freedom. Yeah. But delivering results. Absolutely, gotta, gotta deliver on those outcomes you commit to, right? Yeah. So besides values and commitment, what is a leadership trait you wish you could transfer to every one of your team members right now? Get things done find solutions, never look to the problem. Just find a solution for the problem. After you solve it, you celebrate it, let it go, come back to that problem, and then you figure out so you don't make the same mistake again. Excellent, I love it. And speaking of making mistakes, what's the best mistake you've ever made and how did it make you better? Oh, that's a hard one. I would say that, uh, of course, I made a bunch of mistakes in these years. But I would say that one of the biggest ones were when I got too excited after a trade show, showing the first machine and we decided to replicate the model and make like on that time six machines that I mentioned before without testing it in the market. But talking about positive thinking, uh, I think one of the most important lessons that I learned that I think it's important to share with new entrepreneurs don't design a machine thinking in what you think they need. Because designing something maybe look harder, but finding someone to buy it is much harder. So don't design something that you think is right. Find a customer, look what they need, and then you design something around that. I think that's a very important point that I learned. Market research and product market fit. You've heard it on this show, not quite a million times, but a lot of times believe entrepreneurs who've been through it when they say work on your market research go ask go ask those hundred people if they're interested in this work on the product market fit because if you don't do it now you're going to end up doing it later hear me now believe me later market research product market fit 100 percent of you find a customer first if not you're in trouble even though i have a brilliant idea doesn't matter it's about timing and the customer yep don't believe me believe marcus and the other entrepreneurs we've had on this show who've said the same thing so who is a leader or business figure that you admire and what makes them stand out to you? I would say a business person. I would skip because some people don't like him. Uh, Elon Musk. Uh, I do think he's brilliant and I do think his aggressiveness and the lack of, he's never scared, right? He just got things done and I love that. Yeah, we hear that answer a lot. Oh, that, I'm, there's a lot to admire about Elon. And then, you know, there's, there's some other things as well. So, For but sure. you know, no none, one is perfect, right? None of us are perfect. I've got my bad qualities. I'm, you know, so I'm sure there, I'm sure there are people watching this right, right now going, I can't believe I'm watching this guy again. So, yeah. So you've mentioned some setbacks in the past. Entrepreneurship is hard. It's, it's not, it's not an easy life. It's not, it's not what we all think it is when we first get into it or when we first want to become entrepreneurs. So what keeps you up at night? What are the big challenges you're facing and how are you handling them? Our current uh, challenge is space. So we are growing and we don't have enough space. So that's our, what's 
keeping me awake at night mm -hmm. is like, we need a new building. We need a third building. So this is what it's keeping me awake. Space. Uh, I believe it because you guys are getting, a, I'm looking around and there's not a lot of space here, but there's a lot going on. You got to trust me, what you don't see off camera, there's a lot going on here. And I can see how just adding a, a new project or a little bit more, a new customer is going to really max you guys out here. So, yeah. so, all right. In a fast paced, high stakes industry like robotics, how do you stay calm and centered when adversity hits? Friends, friends and people that you admire. Uh, let's say a year ago, just give an example if I can, uh, we face a huge technical problem and I need to take a decision or I change the strategy or uh, I would be in trouble sooner or later. So we took a step back without having the solution yet. And I just started contacting friends everywhere in Europe, in Mexico, in South America, in the US saying, Hey, I have a problem. I have a problem. I have a problem. I need help. So it cost me a lot of money, but I brought like different, like four or five people from different background to find a solution for that problem. And it was the best thing that I did because before that I was relying one type of knowledge. And when I got a problem there, I was stuck. So that's why we decide to diversify the knowledge in different countries, different people, so we don't go back in that situation again. So I think that was pretty much it. Count on friends, have friends, have a nice network. Call people and ask for advice. Don't be shy. Don't try to figure out by yourself. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Find people you trust, rely on them for good advice, good counsel. Keep building those, keep maintaining those relationships. Stay in touch with people. That's what it's all about. Robots are cool, but at the end of the day, we need humans in our lives to help us out as well. So looking ahead, what's the one thing you're most excited about for AAA 20 coming up this year? For sure, the investment and the new building. So the business model, as I mentioned before, it's consolidated. So it's only a matter of scaling it now. So that's our next challenge. That, that will be a big challenge. And uh, I look forward to hearing how you're going to answer that when some of these investors you're going to talk to are going to ask you how you're going to scale. Thank you. I look forward to hearing that. We'll have to, after you've done a couple pitches, we'll have to have you back on and, and find out how your pitching went. So a pleasure. gratitude is very powerful. Who or what are you most grateful for so far in life? The American dream. So I always protect the American dream when I travel abroad. I, I have been in Europe a hundred times for work and I always talk to people. I, I do believe by far U.S. still the nicest country for entrepreneurship. Uh, as I said, I travel a lot. I have been in 48 countries. Uh, and when you talk about different countries, you always have a problem, a roadblock, bureaucracy. And I'm very thankful to the American people for receiving us as an immigrant and giving us the opportunity to have our own business here. So I'm very thankful to the American dream. Uh, we're, we're thankful to have you. Those are, those are wonderfully kind words. I know, I know we're, we're all going through a little bit of a tough time right now, the way we feel about America. So that's, that's really great to hear. That makes me feel really optimistic about our future. And if you're having a bad day and have not feeling great about America, come on down and see what Marks and the team are doing down here. I think you'll start feeling a lot better about what America has to offer the world. So thank, thank you for some really kind words that I think a lot of Americans need to hear right now. So for all of our future leaders and entrepreneurs watching, what's your best piece of advice for someone who's got a big technology vision they want to bring into the world? Find a customer. Once you find a customer, everything goes smoother. I see some brilliant companies that they go down, not because they have a bad product, it's because they couldn't find a customer. Or when they found the customer, the customer are not ready and they could not wait for a year. So that's very sad when you see a very nice technology that they need the cash flow and they're ready and the customer is not ready for any reason, mm -hmm. then they go down. That's such a sad situation. So find a customer first. Market research product market fit, find a customer, write it down. I think that's the last time I'm going to say it on this episode. <laughs> Everything's really moving really fast in the robotics industry. What else should we know about you and AAA 20 robotics going forward? Yeah, I mean, 
the rental concept of lease or what we call the RAS robot as a service is a great way of looking to American manufacturing and make US more independent. So we are going to do rental robots for any type of repetitive, ta repetitive tasks in manufacturing. So our idea is to design product based on customer needs. So if a customer calls us and say, hey, make a tour in my factory in Arizona, take a look on that things that people don't want to do it, let us know and we can do it for you. And then you can hire our robots to yeah. work for you. Yeah, robots and humans working together, yeah. not competing with each other. I love it. Where can our audience find you, AAA20 Robotics, and keep up with everything that's going on with your company? I think the best way would be LinkedIn. We are active on LinkedIn, showing different aspects from robotics. And just I just remember an interesting point is that many people overseas the importance of robotics also for automating factories when it's dark because a robot don't need lights. If you don't need lights, you don't need also you don't need AC. So doing that, you are helping the environmental as well because no lights, no AC, less energy consumption. So also robots bring to manufacturing a clean and green thinking as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot we haven't even scratched the surface on how robots are going to help us make the world a better place in the future. I'm excited we're going to have to have you back and talk about all of that. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank all of you for joining us for another episode. If you liked what Marcus had to say today, please reach out to him on LinkedIn. Thank him for joining us. Also, check out some of our other videos and other guests who have been on. Please like, comment, and if you know someone who would love to hear what Marcus had to say, please share this episode with them and also subscribe to our channel. It helps us out so much, especially if you're listening on a podcast platform or watching on a podcast platform and you can leave us a five-star review, that would be so helpful to us and getting the message out about this podcast and sharing and putting the spotlight on great folks like Marcus and his company. So we love sharing these interviews with you. Once again, thanks for joining us. Keep watching and developing your leader's mindset onward and upward.